I was asked to start the event and I will be reading two poems. It's great to be here with you all. Uh, the title of the first poem is called Remembering Our Aunt Julia. Maybe I should do the microphone. Okay. Remembering Our Aunt Julia, part one. My Aunt Julia was the map maker in the family, cartographer in other circles. She walked in heavy work boots across the land, cigarette hanging on her lips, bent under the wind and her mother's scorn. She idolized her older brother, my father, followed him with hazel eyes in dark sun brown skin that held her rage quite unnoticed. Her words were always kind to us, the children, warm hands on our foreheads, smoothed out our fears, eased us to dream. French words, English words, or Hungarian, she spoke and read while the ducks and the geese had to be fed each night to dinner on the table by 8 p.m. She loved reading almost more than anything. Birth, two girls lost one within 10 days. Morning Glory grew up strong by her mother's side, each breath strengthened by her child for the world that is a struggle to get a steeper head instead of sideways. Can you tell which way she went? I look in my heart to find the path my aunt Julia scribed there. The second poem is a response to this poem by my sister. Her name is Yoshka. Remembering our Aunt Julia, part two. My Aunt Julia's eyes like melting lava, the warmth that made you feel so you don't know where you are, but in love where you are. No questions and no answers, stay and relax. The world can wait, you are here, being loved, definitely. Your turn. <laughs> I hope I can see, although I passed my driver's license exam. I'm very happy to be here with the mob and with Celeste. And um, um, we're going to begin with a poem um, beyond the time of words. And um, Celeste today this afternoon asked me, well, how did you know you were going to write this book about the pandemic? And the truth is, I did not know I was going to write a book about the pandemic. And I often don't know that I'm going to write a book till uh, the book writes itself. And we can talk about that later. But uh, there is a fluidity to, to poetry and it just happens. So I write in Spanish. It's not that I don't speak English or cannot write it in English, but this is my choice of languages. So I'll begin now. Más allá del tiempo y las palabras, la bruma disipando las formas, crepitando entre los umbrales, siempre la niebla hechicera, invitada transparente y a destiempo. El paso de un tiempo sin tiempo, un silencio sin ecos. El temor a los espejos y a nosotros. Viajamos entre las sombras y la confianza de lo conocido que es lo desconocido. Más allá del tiempo y las palabras, en el reverso de la escritura muda, atardeceres, la vida en sí, en la claridad fugitiva del ocaso, una mujer dando a luz. Beyond the time of words. Beyond the time of words, the mist dissolves forms, curling between the thresholds like an ill-timed and unwelcome sorceress. 
the passage of time without time, a silence without echoes, dreading mirrors and ourselves. We travel among the shadows and a trust of the known that is unknown. Beyond time and words, on the other side of silence, a universe of astonishment, life itself, in the fugitive clarity of twilight, a woman giving birth. I think um, perhaps we should talk a little bit about this poem. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Or we can read another. What would you like to do? No, well, I was thinking that uh, I want to appreciate your work as a translator. Okay. Uh, I translate myself and I understand and feel the, uh, accept the elegance and uh, um, the elegance of your translations. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, Marjorie is, uh, writes very lyrically. Mm -hmm. And reading her latest book that was reissued, I have, you know, there is, it's like every paragraph I can make a poem out of. It is absolutely beautiful. Here is an example called Carmen Sita. Carmen Sita Carrasco, 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 Carrasco appears behind the night with her enchanting scissors, cutting scraps of life and making curtains resembling green boards and incantations. She likes percale, poplin, and cobalt blue linen cloth and makes us clothes for traveling in imaginary and imagined carriages as she covers us with shawls to astound us before love and its splendors. I mean, that is just, Absolutely beautiful, in my Thank opinion. You. I'm just, no, I'm you. just saying, um, the translation is a really important part of poetry. Mm -hmm. There are lots of uh, translators out there. And knowing I'm translate, I've translated poetry myself and it's, it's hard work, but it's lovely work. It is and it isn't. <laughs> it depends on how, how close you feel to the writing. And for me, translation just happened. It really did. I never thought of myself as a translator. In fact, when I was very young, I had the audacity to think that I could <laughs> translate a driver's license manual <laughs> into Spanish, no less, uh, for Spanish speakers in the city where I lived, north of Boston. And it was a horrific translation and my Spanish teacher told me so, and she actually tossed it in the rubbish can. So to think that I, you know, it's not that I'm defying her and I'm trying to prove to her that, you know, I, I, I can do it. It's something that I truly love. And I see myself more as a guardian of words um, because what I'm doing is interpreting another culture and trying to make that transport that culture rather mm -hmm. um, into English. Yeah. And not only am, do I see myself as a guardian of words, but were of words that were originally written by Marjorie in this case, to record and to also preserve yeah. memories of the past. Um, well, my experience of translating, uh, I translated the Hungarian poet um, for many years without the poet knowing it. And then I sent her uh, the manuscript and I talked to her later and asked her for input. And one of her friends, those of you who spoke English very well in Hungarian, said that I don't know English very well and I don't know Hungarian very well, which at first just stab me in the heart, but then I realized that that's a good thing mm -hmm. because the freedom of not being literally tied to either one allows me to fly and just 
get the essence. It's what mm -hmm. we're looking for, the experience, you know. Um, have you translated anything? Yeah, I'd like to say, I'd like to hear both of you as translators, but I'd like to speak a little bit about um, Celeste's uh, translation process that I um, witnessed um, as a poet. And I think that Celeste works like in layers. First, she kind of uh, gives punctuation and rhythm uh, to my poem. And I usually, um, it's not that I want to say that I am a messy poet, but it's, it's so intuitive that um, I sometimes think that everybody would understand it, but it's not the case. So Celeste clarifies it. And, and then she, uh, it's very, like, it's, like Emot said, very elegant, very thoughtful. She looks for the words that evoke this um, lyrical sentiment expressed in, in the language. Um, and it takes a long time and it's, uh, it's almost craft. It's almost like doing a, a tablecloth that you embroider very, very delicately. Um, so it's a very, very intricate process. I and, and mark your question. I've translated um, interested from um, Spanish to English. I've translated um, some of the works of Gabriela Mistral, and it's very, very hard to translate her because she uses almost with an archaic Spanish. So I have to like really search for this word, and that has been a, for me a very um, challenging process. I've also translated some of the work of um, Nicanor Parra, Violeta Parra, but always from the Spanish um, to the English. And English is not my native language, but what the monk said is interesting when, when it's really not your native language, because um, I think you have the feeling of what, it, what is it like to be translated. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know where to go from there. Um, Marjorie mentioned mentioned the multi layers, and this is true. I mean, some of the poetry went through a series of sixteen versions or more, and in some cases, we would cut dramatically verses that were originally written, and in other cases, we wouldn't. Um, what has been amazing about our collaborations together through the years is the fact that we have worked for more than th three decades together and we trust one another implicitly. So if I have a question about the most inane, <laughs> most trivial piece um, in the poem, um, Marjorie and I can sit for a good while and discuss one word or one image. And sometimes if the image doesn't quite have a corresponding uh, word in English because it's very idiomatic and tied to the culture, we'll change the word in Spanish so that it will match the English. That doesn't happen often, but sometimes it does. I mean, sometimes you just hit these stumbling blocks, but they're really not stumbling blo blocks because they allow both our imaginations to fly <laughs> and to search beyond to look for other possibilities. And what is remarkable about writing, because I don't consider myself a poet by any stretch, um, but through my translations of Marjorie through the years, I have come to appreciate more the world around me and the beauty of nature and the beauty of the most simple elements that most of us don't really take very much time to think about. But when you're, when you're translating, it, it's part of the job. I mean, you really have to ponder, what does this word mean? And why did the poet choose this particular word over another word? Well, my, trans my translation process is a bit different. 
and I would have to say that I I eat the poems <laughs> and keep it in in the digestive system for many months and read it again and read it again and read it again and one day it comes out either from translating from English to Hungarian or Hungarian to English comes out with the necessary that I'm aiming for and it's not about talking to anybody it's not about uh, reconsidering it's happening all on a subliminal level mm -hmm. or subconscious level um, but then when it's ready to come out I trust it and I let it come out mm -hmm. as it is and uh, I cannot stand re-editing or rewriting at all mm -hmm. so, uh, why don't we read some more poetry, Marjorie? Okay, so how can I keep it? It's more much better. Okay, it's the okay. Anybody has any questions on translating? <laughs> yes, Charles. Um, so mostly you've been translating Marjorie's poetry. But now you're, you've translated a, a memoir. Um, if I can say that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm curious what, the, what that experience was going from poetry to memoir was for you as a translator. Um, a slight correction. Mm. The memoir came first. Oh, OK. Um, my translations of poetry, of Marjorie's poetry, came after my oh. translation of the memoir. I was translating other poets. Um, could you ask? Could you ask Charles's question? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. The question. The question was. Um, now that you're translating a memoir. Now that I'm translating a memoir, um, what are the differences? Yeah. What was the shift? Like? What was the shift like with Marjorie? It really wasn't a dramatic shift because Marjorie is a lyrical prose writer, so her prose is full of metaphors full of poetry, full of sound and rhythm. And both her mother's and her father's memoirs, because I, I translated two, uh, are written in fragments, almost as if they were straps, long straps in, in poems. So the prose itself, I actually do not enjoy translating prose. I much rather prefer translating poetry because there is a freedom in translation with poetry, free verse versus rhymed verse. I don't translate rhymed verse. I am horrified at the prospect of attempting um, rhymed verse. Um, yeah, there really, I really don't feel a difference at all in translating. Yeah. Oh, yes. No, I, I like what. I, and I agree with what Sylvester says. I also don't feel a difference um, because they are almost uh, the expressions, the the emotions that are expressed in the prose are expressed in the poetry, but the problem is the readers. Um, and even though people say, no, writers don't write about readers, there is a certain responsibility to a reader. and. I am very interested in what people are going to say, to feel. So I am interested in a reader. But readers, unfortunately, especially in, in this society, um, the American society, we categorize everything. So a memoir is supposed to be like this. You have to be semi-objective. Um, and I remember when this book came out 30 years ago, a lot of, you know, of course, my mother was proud. Here, there's a book about me. Well, all of us would be proud. But her friend said, I don't like that book because it doesn't have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I thought, who wants to have a beginning, middle, and an end? This is not who I am. I'm a, I'm a poet where uh, literature happens in a, in, in a timeless uh, sight. We have in a sense of timelessness. Uh, so right now, after 30 years that have passed, I'm going to ask the new readers to join me in becoming and feeling closer to poetry than their idea of prose. But 
if you read all these wonderful essays by Emerson, Sarah, Shakespeare, they're also lyrical essays. But I have to draw the reader into my, my world and without categorizations. So why don't we read another piece from your world? Um, Marjorie had chosen um, the poem Summers in Quisco because it is a poem that is very dear to her heart. It is about her mother and her father in the time that they spent in the summer in Quisco, uh, Chile. So why don't you begin, Marjorie? And okay, I'll so um, we, when this book was published a year ago and we went to it was very interesting. We had um, a reading in the Los Angeles Aquarium, really with the aquarium, with all the beautiful sea creatures. Look it up, that sings Emma, but I feel like better. Okay. And um, um, everyone in that audience understood this poem because a preface to this, and then Celeste will read the English, it's about summers in, in a village, and all of us have had some kind of summer in some kind of village. So this is called Veranos en el Quisco. Íbamos al cine del Quisco, incrustado como una pequeña joya, salvaje y humilde entre las montañas y el Pacífico desaforado. A veces el mar entraba por las ventanas quebradas, Y se sentaba con nosotros. I have to translate this. The, we, we went to the movies and the sea sat next to us because the windows of the theater were broken. No? Éramos siempre los mismos, los que íbamos al cine, porque sabíamos leer los subtítulos de las películas extranjeras que a menudo llegaban atrasadas, como los periódicos. Vivimos así, leyendo lo que pasó ayer, contando lo que pasaba días atrás, como las señoras que se vestían de fiesta, los domingos mirando películas de hace muchos años con los recién nacidos en sus brazos. Todo en aquel pueblo y en aquel cine transcurría con la lentitud de la poesía. Viví cerca del mar en Quisco, comprendo para no... Por Comp ah, comprendo para no perder los comprando para no perder los periódicos del domingo conversando sobre el difícil estado del mundo y ah, las guerras lejanas vivíamos felices sin prisa en casas pequeñas pero abundantes en visitas conocíamos a nuestros vecinos Oh, it goes on. Y desde las ventanas rotas nos despedíamos cada noche y nos saludábamos cada mañana. Uh, we will skip, I will go to the last verse because it's a long poem. So I'll go here. Y yo vivía enseñando poemas y contando aquellas películas a, los, a las que no podía ir al cine. Y luego a mi abuela, que era sorda, Y mágica. I didn't know that I wrote such a long poem. <laughs> Ahora, al pensar en el cine de aquel pueblo, me lleno de la gratitud de la inocencia por aquel mundo que no se ha ido, que está en la fragilidad de la memoria, en el mar sentado entre nosotros. And before Celeste um, translates this, I like to say that uh, we always say, well, uh, people no longer read their no bookstores. They are wrong. People read their bookstores. And not everything disappears. So the idea of watching a film in a little village could happen everywhere in the world. Um, I think that deep down I like to say that we cannot become cynical about our beloved past, that the past is still with us and the past will, will have a future. And I think this is to me 
uh, the core of the poem. You'd like to, you would like to say something? Okay, I'm just gonna uh, treat you all. And I saw you uh, close your eyes while you're listening in Spanish. So I'm gonna treat you to some Hungarian. It's a yes. very short yes. poem, but I want you to close your eyes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Már egy hete, csak a mamára gondolok, mindig megmegállva. Nyikorgó kosárra lölé, bement a padlásra, ment a serényen. Én még őszinte voltam, ordítottam, toporzék voltam. Hagyja a dabadruhát másra, engem ugyan a padlásra. De ő csak ment, és teregedett némán, nem szidott, nem is nézett én rá. Now the third language is going to be English, a Marjorie's poem. Okay. He closed his eyes. Huh? He closed his eyes. Yeah, I know, I know. Summers in Kisco. We used to go to the cinema in Kisco, which was embedded like a small jewel, wild and humble between the mountains and the unbridled Pacific Ocean. At times, the sea would enter through the broken glass and nestle with us. We were always the same ones, those who went to the movies, because we knew how to read the subtitles of foreign films that often arrived late, like the newspapers. We lived this way, reading about what happened yesterday, talking about what happened days before, like the women who dressed up on Sundays, watching movies from long ago while holding newborns in their arms. Everything in that town and in that cinema transpired with the slowness of poetry. I lived near the sea in Gisco, buying the Sunday newspapers for my father, talking about the feverish state of the world and about distant wars. We lived happily and comfortably in houses that were small but full of visitors. We knew our neighbors, and from the cracked windows, we said goodbye every night and greeted one another every morning. I still remember when the gift of imagining was allowed. And I used to talk alone with the characters in films and with ones I invented. No one told me that I was a silly girl. On the contrary, they were interested in all that I imagined. And this is how the gift of words was born in me. The ones I joined together like a necklace and recited on nights with a full moon and pink sea. I was so happy in Kisco where nothing happened. Babies were born and old people died content, waiting for a cup of tea. And I lived dreaming about poems and talking about those films to the ones who could not go to the movies and later with my grandmother who was deaf and magical. Now, as I think about the cinema of that town, I am filled with the gratitude of innocence for, the, for that world, which has not gone away, which exists in the fragility of my memory, in the sea that rests between us. Huh? What can you say after that? Oh. <laughs> yeah. You know, we had a reading in Maine uh, in the early fall, and some of my friends came, and they don't speak Spanish. Um, and some of them don't read poetry. And some of them don't read poetry. <laughs> and my friend Esther said that this was her favorite poem because it reminded her of her childhood in Colorado and in Indiana. <laughs> and I also, as your translator, made a connection uh, with my trips to the cinema as well and with our family trips to Maine, the Maine coast, every summer. There was a little Greek village and we would all get together and everybody would speak Greek. My sister's here today. Remember those times? Um, there's so much life in Marjorie's poetry. 
there's so much celebration of life and of the beauty of the world. Yes, there are sorrows as well, but Marjorie never gives in to those sorrows. She talks about them because they exist and they must be acknowledged. And she certainly had a very difficult childhood having to leave one's homeland at the age of 15 and not speak very much English and end up in Georgia. <laughs> I was, was quite a shock, right? Um, but she made it, she made it. And we're very fortunate that she has. Um, that's about all I can say about this song. I think also, Emon, can I share the story of having to leave everything behind and never, uh, not like Lot's wife, we never turn back. Um, but I like to just say one comment, and I like for Emon to talk about this also. Uh, I've never liked Georgia because I suffered as a young girl and I suffered terrible prejudice. And it has nothing to do, you know, um, I am a blonde or blue eyed person. It's, they did not discriminate because of my skin color. They, they didn't like foreigners. Everybody who was slightly different than you, who had a slight accent, who look at the world differently. But I realize now that I came to visit my mother that I have reconciled with the Georgia landscape, with the lush greens, with the beautiful magnolias. But then I always talk to myself and question myself. And I said, why? It's not that, of course, it's because I have changed because the landscape is the same. But because I, I, I decided to choose kindness over, um, revenge, betrayals, um, animosities. And that is uh, one of the most important decisions of my life as a writer and as a person. So of course I love it. And I always uh, talk to my family, to my husband, to my kids, but Georgia is not so bad. It has a beautiful landscape. And then once you choose this act of kindness, it's like the world changes colors. It's not, it doesn't exist only uh, in the darkness. Interestingly enough, these kids that drove me crazy in, high, in middle school and high school um, reached out to me when, I, when they found out I was a published writer. I could not talk to them. So instead of being saying, oh, you are such a fool, you bothered me for five years of my life, what did I do? I did the most elegant thing, like Buckingham Palace, say nothing. <laughs> so this is my theme. I said nothing. And that's also saying nothing is an act of kindness. So this is how you reconcile in a new place. Uh, and you reconcile with the world you left behind. And now uh, uh, I've reconciled. Chile is not the Chile of my youth. It has changed. It's, unfortunately, it's become very violent. But I still live on the Chile of my youth, and I like to ask Emma if she lives in, in, in her Hungary. I'm heading back there in about two months. Uh, leaving Hungary was not my choice. Right? It was a family decision, so I was a minor, so I had to agree to it. But I'm glad I'm here. Uh, I was 15, like you. I spoke no English at all. Plus, my teachers told me I had no aptitude for languages. <laughs> so we landed in New York City, and I said, oh, God, I never learned this language. Um, so there was a definite uh, break in the continuation. But returning to the beloved homeland and the uh, the family that made it so special is always an act of absolute reward for me. So I'm going to go and get rewarded again. Hungary is a very uh, changed politically. The landscape somewhat remains, so I'm going to look for the landscape that I grew up in. 
Do we have any questions? We, we have, any? have one from the virtual audience. Let me pose this one to you. This is from Kathy. I'm particularly curious about how writers navigate the potential feelings and reactions of still living people who are part of their narratives. Do you want to answer that? Well, um, uh, when you're writing, you can't really consider that, or at least I do not consider that. I haven't written um, badly about anyone who's still alive because I have nothing bad to say. Um, I was lucky and my family was fabulous. So um, I don't think that a writer, a good writer, will be guided by who's going to say what um, in their life or in their writing. I think that's what I feel. So maybe this uh, question um, is very much directed to me. Um, the first version of The Cross and the Star um, appeared in Spanish and it had another title. It was called uh, Sagrada Memoria, Sacred Memory. I didn't, uh, just like a monk, I did not speak badly of certain family members, but I spoke the truth. And sometimes the truth may be interpreted as something terrible, but one of them was a thief and stole money from people. And I said that without mentioning their names. And another one uh, thought of himself to be a member of the aristocracy and where he was, and also, he was very much a fascist and a supporter of the Chilean dictator, Augusto Pinochet, never mentioning their names. They recognize each other. <laughs> like they say, page 13, she wrote about me. I don't regret a thing. And if, you know, my father were alive, because he would agree with me, um, because he said you did the right thing to mention to mention them, it added spice to the story. It was truthful. It had no first name or last name. But my mother, who always tried to reconcile and always chose the path of peace, she said, I shouldn't have done it. I disagree with my mother. I had to do it. And um, um, there was one particular member of my family who, who was really upset at me for years, but but then he had, like we say in Spanish, you have two choices, to become upset and then not to become upset. So after many years, he stopped becoming upset. And he understood why I wrote that about him, because I said that while Chile was starving uh, for the lack of water, he was always bragging about having water for his golf course and for the country club. So I re this is a good story about how, how people view justice. And he finally understood why I said it, but I completely agree with him all. If we were to worry about what everyone would say, we might as well never, never get out of bed. You know, always being bombarded by what a reader would say. You found a place or <laughs> I think this would be a perfect time if there isn't another question. I I was just curious if Marjorie, would you be willing to say that uh, saying in Spanish, in Spanish, uh, what, do in Espanol. but we don't have it in Spanish. In you here. don't have it in Spanish. It's at home. But I will let Celeste read because that's a very small print. Yeah. You'd like me to read? You this? want? Yes. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. This this is um, part of the. It is the, story? the beginning of a cross and a star. Where, mem where Marjorie talks about memory and the importance of memory and what it means to be a writer and to confront the truth. She begins, everything I tell you is true and this is why I write so that it will be even more certain. This poignant line for the opening, oh no, I'm sorry. I chose the wrong you section. Say, I didn't. Uh, the introduction. No, I, I, I was reading. I was reading from the forward. This is about memories. I'm sorry. 
Memories. Passing memory, imagined and intermittent. Memory like a chest of magical echoes, like a compass in a familiar closet. I gaze at my memory and shake her long locks of hair, not knowing if I tell what I invent or if I invent what I tell. I wish to talk about a mythical and myth-making country on the southernmost tip of the planet. It is called Chile, a fertile and generous land. It is a country of deluded wanderers and poets. I have to stop here for one second to explain. Marjorie is writing her mother's memoir and is speaking as if she were her mother, Frida. Okay, she is not speaking as the daughter in this portion of this fragment. My father, Frida's father, my father arrived here escaping from a Viennese cabaret dancer and his brother arrived escaping from the gas chambers. I was raised in a very small town named Osorno where I learned about the tepid rocks of the dawn and about the coriander and where I also learned that Jewish girls could not go to the German, English or Catholic schools. Attendance, however, was allowed at the less prosperous Indian school where they learned how to love me and where I didn't feel like an outsider. In Osorno, Chile, the Nazis were the great feudal lords of the South and being Jewish was like possessing a savage and dangerous scar. I write these sometimes intermittent and true memories with the voice of an adolescent and then of a woman. I approach them, my memories, pulling out from my body a star of David and the Yiddish language secretly spoken in the silence of castrated faces. In a cross and a star, I wish to talk about my life in an unseemly and noisy house in southern Chile and about a town with 50 Nazis and three Jewish families. Everything I tell you is true. And this is why I write so that it will be even more certain. Would you like to comment? Basically, um, is it Celeste read what I was just speaking about, the, the alliance with the truth. Um, and I thought that if people recognized um, themselves there, it was their problem, not mine as a writer. Because I chose the path of honesty and, and really the path of truth. The first poem I translated from Hungarian into English was by the poet Igor Stula, who was the uh, authority of Hungary for many, many years, decades, really. But in it, there's a line that if the poet doesn't tell the truth, the poet will turn blue. <laughs> I haven't turned blue yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, you have not to fear. Yeah. You don't have fear. Yeah. Just to ask a wrap up question, unless we have another question from the live audience. What does the idea of home mean, especially if you think about returning to a homeland? Does that resonate? And Emoka, since you're going to Hungary soon, home. Homeland. Well, um, I still have great 
family in Hungary. So I always look forward to that. But this particular trip, uh, my partner and I are going to Hungary to place a commemorative plaque uh, in honor of my father and my uncle who were part of the underground movement in 1944 through 50 when they were in prison basically in Hungary. And uh, that, uh, that is a good enough reason to go, but I would take any chance that I can to go back because there are great mm, baths, hot baths everywhere. <laughs> and now does that connect to the idea of home for you or homeland? Anyway? There was no uh, taking that out of me, the home or the homeland, that's it. Uh, I chose to live in the United States for the last 60, 60, almost 60 years. So that is a pleasant choice for me. Uh, so I can't be divided. Either I'm here or when I'm there, I'm there. I, I spent the first 10 years of my life being in New York City, uh, pining after Hungary. And one day I said, I can't do this. When I'm here, I gotta be here. And when I'm in Hungary, I just am who I am. But I had to find my American self too. So here you got it. I love what Amolka said, and I agree that I also cannot be divided. When I'm in Chile, I'm in Chile. When I'm here, here. Um, we also have. Um, a beautiful extended family of, of almost uh, uh, 200 people. And for Jewish people to have an extended family is incredibly important because we're still feeling uh, the aftermath of, of the Holocaust. And, uh, and what I love about my family is that they don't make a difference if you're first cousin, second cousin, nephew, niece is a huge clan. And when I go home, um, I return to language, to my landscape, even though we have the Pacific Ocean everywhere in the United States, the California coast, Oregon. It's not the same, the smell, the ruggedness, the, the birds. Um, and I like to return home and we have a home. After my grandmother passed, I didn't want to like, uh, uh, leave with go visit my stay at my cousin's home. I wanted to belong again, um, and it has been really. Um, and it, uh, Celeste has has been to her home. It's been a, a, a great um, decision. Even though everyone told me you're crazy, but I feel rooted. I feel rooted in by the sea, in inside the sea almost. And every night, I look at the lights of El Paraiso and imagine that uh, in 1939, my great grandmother arrived. I could, every night I think of her arriving to the port and, and finding refuge. Um, for me, Chile became a place of refuge for my family. If not, I wouldn't be here. And as for us, uh, I love what Mok said, to find your American self. Well, not even Americans find their American self. <laughs> this country is very convoluted, uh, fascinating, but I must say that I love this country too. And I always tell my students and I always tell my children, this country is worth fighting for. It's worth it. And it, could, it will change because if it stays the way it is, there's no sanity anymore. Um, and if we talk all day about Tucker Carlson, we're going to collapse. We're going to be fired like Tucker Carlson. So the, I love to be also belonging to the place where I am, where I teach, where I build friendships. It's important. I want to just leave you all my part with an image. In 1964, uh, we finally got a visa to and to leave Hungary and emigrate to the United States. We took a, uh, an ocean liner, uh, SSA America, to, from Le Havre to New York City. 
and um, everybody was excited as we were getting close to New York, to New York City. And we all ran out and my mother and my sister went, we stood by the railing. And it was a misty morning. And as it approached, uh, the mist separated uh, the Statue of Liberty, her hands with a flame and her head showed up. And deep down, I think that was a welcome that uh, continued within me for many years. So I landed. <laughs> 